Uh, time to record again. All right, if you brought the Oxford practice set with you, go ahead and pull that out. <coughs> now, if you don't have your practice set with you, just make sure you take really good notes. Okay, first thing I need to point out about the practice set. In the announcements, there is a typo. Um, it tells you that on page, I think it's 100. Okay, as we go through this, we'll look at it. Yeah, page 100, tax receipts journal, there's a typo for the sales discount. I'll leave this up here for a couple of weeks, okay? Just because somebody's going to forget to look at this and they're going to start working on this. Something's not going to work. And they're not going to figure out why. So I'm going to leave that up there. So it should be 577, not 5777. That's on page 100 of the cash receipts journal. That is part of the section that we're going to work on. So that's the first thing that I want to point out about the practice. Now, in Blackboard, You've got an entire folder devoted to the practice set assignment. So anything that you've got in terms of questions or you need instructions or directions, this needs to be your first destination. Now, the general instructions is the first one. Okay, so I'll click on that and it'll tell you about part one, part two, basically the approach that I use to go through it. And then if you want more detail, on the actual grading of part one and part two, I've got the grading rubrics posted down here. You can take a look at those for right now. Probably you just want to focus on part one in terms of how it's going to be graded. Now, there's some additional information that you need to review that would be very helpful before you actually start trying to work on this practice set. Because part of the process of the practice set is you're going to use special journals <laughs> and subsidiary ledgers. Okay, now some of you may or may not be familiar with the function of those tools in an accounting cycle. Typically, when you take financial accounting at an introductory level, we don't have the time to teach you guys about subsidiary ledgers and special journals, but I noticed some of you have background in accounting doing various accounting functions, so you may have already been exposed to this or have used these particular tools. If you're not familiar, I've given you some links here to materials associated with your textbook so you can go and get an idea of how those particular tools operate in a manual system. Now, very simply, a subsidiary ledger, okay, is just a ledger with additional detail. Now, most of the time when you take financial accounting, we tell you that everything gets recorded in the general ledger. Okay? Not necessarily the case 100% of the time. There are certain accounts where to preserve detail, we want to use a subsidiary ledger instead of the general ledger. Okay? The account where you will most often find subsidiary ledgers used is with accounts receivable and accounts payable. Now you may also find subsidiary ledgers used with inventory, but that's not part of this project. Okay? As, part of, as part of the practice set, you will have a subsidiary ledger for both your accounts receivable and your accounts payable. Now why do you think I might want to use a subsidiary ledger with more detail for receivable and payable? Well, because I need a lot more information for those types of accounts. Let's think about accounts receivable for just a second. Accounts receivable represent money that your customers owe you. Okay? So what kind of detail might you want to have if somebody owes you money? You might want to know their name, you might want to know their address, you might want contact information, you might want to track the sales that you make to that particular customer. You want to track their payments. All of those things can be done in a subsidiary ledger. Okay? And you keep a running total, and typically subsidiary ledgers, you've got a couple of options here. 
uh, depending on the accounting system that you're using, will either post the activity for that customer to the subsidiary ledger on a daily basis, or maybe even at the end of the week. The technology that we have today is typically done on a daily basis. So you want to keep a real-time activity and a running balance for those customers that owe you money. You want to know when that money schedule is to come in, when it's due, et cetera, et cetera. Hence the purpose of a subsidiary ledger. If you're going to use subsidiary ledgers as part of the practice set. Now, the other place that's common for subsidiary ledgers to be used is accounts payable. What do accounts payable represent? Right, money you owe to somebody else, something you've got to pay. So it's kind of the flip side of accounts receivable, but you need a lot of the same type of information. You need to know who you owe the money to, when's the money due, contact information, address, banking information, whatever it is, the payments that you make to those vendors, and anything that you purchase from that vendor goes into that subsidiary ledger. Then, when you use these subsidiary ledgers, your accounts receivable account in your general ledger and the accounts payable account in the uh, general ledger serve as what are called control accounts. What that means is if I've got an accounts receivable subsidiary ledger and I go through and I add up all the money that is owed to me by the various customers, when I get to the end of the month, that subsidiary ledger needs to match the control account, the accounts receivable in the general ledger. Same thing with accounts payable. I've got an accounts payable subsidiary ledger that I post to on a daily or weekly basis. By the time I get to the end of the month and do all my journal entries, my, my accounts payable subsidiary ledger needs to match my control account, accounts payable, in the general ledger. Not make a lot of sense to you at this point, but it will once you start working with this or once you need to use the serial. Okay? You've got two subsidiary ledgers that you're going to use as part of this practice set. Also involved in the practice set are the use of special journals. Now, when we teach you financial accounting at the, at the introductory level, we basically tell you that all journal entries should be recorded in the general ledger. Not that way in practice. Um, businesses typically have transactions that share characteristics in common with each other, and so to facilitate the recording process, we develop special journals where we can put those types of transactions that are similar to each other, we can summarize those and make a single journal entry at the end of the month to represent the activity for those high volume, very similar transactions. That's the use of special journals. And you're going to have basically four special journals that you're going to use as part of this practice set. So let's go ahead and dig in and open up your practice set. And let's talk about rock. Now, I'm not going to read this to you. We don't have time. You're going to have to go do the reading on your own. But I'm going to point out the important stuff. Now, at the very beginning of this book, you will notice under the table of contents, you've got two major sections in this particular soft cover book, the practice set. The first section at the top says periodic inventory methods. Then you jump down to the second section, it says perpetual inventory methods. This particular assignment, we're going to work in the section of the book using this perpetual inventory method. So everything that you're going to do for this practice set project starts on page 77 and goes to the end of the book. So you're basically going to use the back half of this this practice set. Okay? It's the same it's the same basic problem, same basic facts in the front part of the book, but the front part of the book uses the periodic inventory method. Not as many companies use periodic inventory, so we're not going to mess with that. Okay. Only focus on the perpetual inventory method starting on page 77. Is everybody hear me? Okay. <coughs> now, from an instructor's perspective, 
there are basically four different practice sets in this one book that I could assign to you. Two of them would be under the periodic system, two of them under the perpetual system. You're only going to do one. You're only going to do one. So don't get overwhelmed by the fact that you've got 140 pages. You're going to use the back half of the book for catching on the four All right. So let's go to page 77. Got the introduction, you got a narrative, you got some background, you may need to know something about what Rockford does, what type of business are they in, what type of a business entity is it, and it will tell you what that is. Okay. Up here at the top, it tells you about the journals that are part of Rockford's accounting system. Okay. You'll notice this is a list of your special journals. You have the sales journal, which is item number one, and on page 77. And a sales journal is used to record sales of merchandise on account. Sales journal, sales of merchandise on account. So what does that mean? If I sell merchandise to a customer, if Rockford sells merchandise to a customer, where to get it, it's through an account receivable. That's the common characteristic. They're selling the merchandise on account. It needs to be recorded in the sales journal. If Rockford makes a sale to a customer for cash, does that go in the sales journal? No, it's going to go somewhere else. So sales journal is only sale on account, i.e. account receivable. Okay. So sales journal is your first special journal. Number two is a purchases journal. Now, the purchases journal is to record the purchases of merchandise on account. Purchases of merchandise on account. So if Rockford makes purchases on account, what account normally is the credit side of the journal? Account payable. <coughs> Means they're going to pay for it at some point in the future. Now if they make a purchase for cash, are you going to put that in the purchases journal? No, it's going to go somewhere else. Only purchases on account, meaning accounts payable. All right, step number three is a cash receipts journal. Okay, and on the cash receipts journal, you're going to report all cash receipts. You're going to report all cash receipts in the cash receipts journal. So, what do you think those transactions all have in common with each other? Do they do cash or do you receive cash, you collect cash? So from that perspective, how, what is the effect on cash accounts? Is that your credit? Debit, okay. So if you're debiting the cash account, you're increasing the cash account, as you receive cash, it probably goes to the cash receipt journal. See how this works? All the transactions in the special journal have something in common. So we're going to put them on the same schedule, the same journal. All right, the next one is a cash disbursements journal. You're going to record all cash payments. What does that mean? What effect does that have on cash? When you make a cash payment, it decreases cash or it depreciates cash. Okay. So if you're paying your utility bill, you got a credit cash, probably debit accounts payable. That's going to go in your cash disbursements journal. If you make, if Rockford makes a purchase of merchandise for cash, they use cash, so they debit inventory, credit cash, it's going to go in the cash disbursements journal. All right. And then the last one is your general journal. Okay. That's just your common everyday general journal. It's your journal of last resort. Journal of last resort, meaning if you can't find the home for it in your sales journal, purchases journal, cash receipts, or cash disbursements, then you're going to use the general journal. So when we teach you guys financial accounting, you take the opposite view and we tell you to put everything in the journal. But now it's kind of twisted, kind of twisted that way. All right. 
In addition, you've got three different ledgers. We'll talk a little bit about ledgers. You've got a general ledger, an account receivable subsidiary ledger, and an account payable subsidiary ledger. Keep in mind, the practice set is nothing more than a manual accounting system. That's all this is. If you understand the intricacies and the operations of the manual accounting system, you will be able to understand any software product on the market. But unfortunately, that knowledge does not go the other direction. Just because you understand QuickBooks, or Peak Tree, or one of these accounting softwares where you know how to do input on some of the accounting screens, does not mean you know the, the manual accounting system. If you can master this manual accounting system, the software becomes very much easier to understand. So you can start with this, to make sure you understand the accounting cycle from step number one all the way to the end. All right, on page 78, they show you the list of the chart of accounts. Okay? This is your universe. These are the accounts that you have to pick from in terms of doing your journal entries, journalizing your transactions. Do not create new general ledger accounts. Okay? Do not create any new general ledger accounts. You should not, there's no reason for you to have to do that. Everything you need is here. Notice I said general ledger accounts. Ledger, but you know All right, down towards the bottom of page 78, it says accounts receivable. You've got a list of customers and their balances with their balances at the end of November in your subsidiary ledger. Then you've got accounts payable, a list of your vendors with their balances at the end of November in your subsidiary ledger. In this particular practice set for Rockford, you're going to do journal entries for the month of December. So the subsidiary ledger balances, your beginning balances are listed there. Bottom of page 78, top of page 79. They are already posted in your subsidiary ledgers. The beginning balance. All right, flip over to page 80. Okay, page 80. You've got the narrative of the December transactions. These are the business transactions that occurred at Rockford during the month of December. Now, as you read through the instructions, what they're going to tell you is that all of the December transactions have been recorded starting with December 1st, going through December 23rd. Okay? So all the transactions on page 80 and 81 and the top part of page 82 all the way through December 23rd, those transactions have already been recorded and journalized in your practice set. So one of the things I would recommend you do that when you first get started is to start reading those transactions during the early part of the month and go and find out how did they record that in the accounting system. So that you can start to learn how to use the journal. Okay? Because you may find that there may be similar transactions that you need to record in the last week of the December that may be very similar to something that's already been recorded. So they're already showing you how to do it. It's the answers are already there. Now there will be some journal entries in here that you probably won't see recorded. And you're going to have to do a little bit of work. You might have to go pull out a reference book or something. You've still got your financial accounting book. You might have to go back and take a look at that to see how to do a journal entry. Okay? Just be aware of that. You're going to start journalizing entries starting December 26th. Okay? The last journal entry was December 23rd. They recorded that one for you. Nothing happened on the 24th or 25th. They were off for vacation, holiday. Well, it starts again on the 26th. Okay? So you've got one journal entry at the bottom of page 82. Then going up to page 83, you're going to have to journalize those transactions and the very top of page 84. So you've got basically a week's worth of transactions you're going to have to record. 
some of which may have already been recorded similar transactions earlier in the month. So you've got some guidelines on how to do that. Take advantage of that. Some of them are not going to, you're not going to see similar transactions. You're going to have to figure out how to record those. So that's where it's going to be nice when you've got those group members. You start sending emails to the group going, okay, that transaction on December 28th, what did you do with that? How did you go about that? You guys can talk to each other and share information. I do not consider that cheating. Okay? We'll copy the answer directly out of the solutions manual. That's cheating. Working together is not cheating for the purpose of understanding. Okay. All right. For part number one, which is going to be due in week three, part number one, you're going to use the instructions on page 84, 85, and 86. Okay. I'll repeat that. For purposes of this practice set, you are going to follow the instructions on page 84. 85 and 86. Now part one, you're only going to do instructions one through four. Okay. Part one consists of instructions one through four found on page 84. If you flip over to page 87, you will see something called an alternative set of instructions. Okay. Mark through pages 87, 88, and 89. Mark through those. Ignore them. Do not pay attention to the alternative set of instructions. Okay? Remember I said there's like four different problems I can give you out of this practice set? That's like a totally separate problem. I want you to use the instructions on page 84, 85, and 86. All right. So on page 84, instruction number one, make the entries in the appropriate journals for December 26th through December 31st. That's the first thing you need to do. You need to learn how to use those special journals. Cash receipts, cash disbursements, sales, purchases. Okay. So remember the accounting cycle? You've got to analyze the transaction. You're going to read the description of the transaction, and you're going to convert that business transaction into debits and credits and a journal entry, and you're going to journalize that entry in these special journals. It's the first couple of steps of the accounting cycle. Hopefully this is starting to ring a bell with you folks. Okay. We're starting the accounting cycle. Then, once you've gotten everything journalized, you're going to do step number two. It says, post any amounts to be posted as individual amounts from the journals to the general ledger and any amounts to be posted to the subsidiary ledger accounts. Again, if you, well, all this is saying is if you've got transactions that involve the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger or the accounts payable subsidiary ledger, post those on a daily basis. It's my recommendation because you don't have that many of them. Go ahead and post those to the subsidiary ledger. Then, once you've got everything journalized, you're going to summarize, you're going to total up your special journals, and you're going to do one entry for each of those journals, typically, for each of those special journals. You're going to post those to the general ledger at the end of the month. That's all step number two is telling you to do. It's a little confusing, but realistically, that's what you're doing in step number two. Okay. Step number three is to split and cross book the column journals, complete the month end postings of all the books of original entry. All right. Footings, you may not understand what that term means. All that means is a footing is adding up a column of numbers. Okay. That's all footing is. Adding up a column of numbers. Cross footing is adding up a row of numbers across a row. So at this point in step number three, let's flip over and let's take a look at some of these special journals. Now your journals start on page 91. Okay. Journals start on page 91. And it gives you a list of the different journals that you will find. You've got a general journal, purchase and sale, cash receipts, and cash disbursement. Okay. So flip over to page 92. 
and you will see the general journal. Now remember what I said about the general journal? This should be your journal of last resort. If you cannot find a home for your journal entry on one of the other special journals, then you can put it in the general journal. And notice you've already got a couple of entries that are already in your general journal for the month of December. The reason for that is because it's those transactions between December 1st through December 23rd that have already been posted for you. Now, you'll notice you've got a little bit of space at the bottom of page 92 and about half the page on page 93. That's more than enough space to record any general journal entries that need to be recorded in the general journal. So what, does, what am I telling you? There's probably not many general journal entries that are going to go in the general journal from December 26th through the 30th, 31st. I'm not saying there's not any. There are a few, but there are not many. You've got sufficient space. Okay? So you don't have to write real tiny, real itty bitty. Just use the lines the way they're showing you up here. Use the proper format. Debits to the left margin. Credit should be indented. Follow the proper format in the general journal. You'll have plenty of space. You'll notice towards the bottom of page 93 there, there's a heading in there that says adjust the entries at 1231.14. What that tells you is you will record your adjusting entries from that point below the heading for your adjusting entries. Adjusting entries are not until part two. You do not have to worry about adjusting entries for part one. What you'll notice, if you flip the page, you'll see there's a blank page on page 94, 95. Get over to page 96, about halfway down, there's another heading. It says closing entries. Okay. So what should you derive from the fact that they've given you almost three pages of journals for adjusting entries? You got a lot of adjusting entries. Fortunately for you guys, it doesn't occur until part two, so don't worry about that. Okay. Then in part two, you've got closing entries. You've got to close the accounting cycle. When you get to that step, you'll record your closing entries in the general journal. Okay. Now flip the page. We're on page 98. Okay. Notice the heading. It says Purchases Journal. And what did it tell us in the background information about the Purchases Journal? We record purchases made on account. In other words, we're going to involve accounts receivable. I'm sorry, accounts payable. Anyway. All right, I've got a column for the day. You've got the month, the day, and then the second column there is a purchase order number. So if they're buying mer merchandise or purchasing merchandise on account, there should be a purchase order associated with it. Account credited, that's the name of the vendor. Find that vendor name in your accounts payable subsidiary ledger. Then the next column over here says account number. That's the account number for the vendor in the subsidiary ledger. Okay. The account number is the vendor's account number in the subsidiary ledger. The last column's over there for amount, the amount of the transaction. Now, when you do journal entries, for this practice set, everything should be rounded to dollars. You should not have any cents in it. None of your journal entries should involve cents. Everything should be rounded to dollars. Okay. Now, notice you've got some entries already on the purchases journal for the first few days of December. You'll probably have a couple more that you're going to add to this. At the end of the month, after you've journalized all the purchases on account, you're going to put that amount column, you're going to come up with a total for that, and you're going to record that total into the general ledger for your purchases made on account for the month of December. So now something you're going to have to think about is what is the journal entry that's generated where I've made purchases on account. I'm going to debit inventory, I'm going to credit accounts payable, and it's going to be for that total. So I'm going to record one journal entry instead of seven or eight individual entries. Okay. That's why we use special journals. And so we can summarize and reduce the number of journal entries we have to record into the general ledger. All right.
on page 99, the sales journal. Okay? The sales journal is used to record sales of merchandise on account. Sales of merchandise on account. So again, you've got a date column, an invoice column, you'll have an invoice number, account debited should be the name of the customer from the account's receivable subsidiary ledger. Account number is that customer's account number in your account's receivable subsidiary ledger. Then you've got a column and at the top of that column it says accounts receivable DR, meaning the total of this column, you're going to split it, you're going to total them up at the end of the month, you're going to debit accounts receivable and you're going to credit sales revenue. That's the first column. But you're only going to do that for the total. <coughs> You've got probably 12, 15 transactions on your sales journal. You're going to make one journal entry to your general ledger. It's going to be a debit to accounts receivable, credit to sales. Now, throughout the month, you're going to record the individual transactions to the subsidiary ledgers, so the purchases journal and the sales journal. At the end of the month, you're going to record that grand total just to the general ledger. And at the end of the month, after all your journals have been done, remember your control account and your general ledger needs to match your subsidiary ledger. If you've done it correctly, they will. They'll match each other. And that's what you've got to achieve. All right, the second column, that last column on the right hand side, notice at the top, says cost of goods sold, debit, inventory, credit. In a perpetual inventory system, we record two entries. The first entry is to record the sales price. The second entry is to record the effect on the inventory at cost. Okay. You need to read the background to determine how you calculate the cost of the inventory. So I'll give you a formula to use. And again, after you journalize all the sales for the month, You'll total that column, you'll make one journal entry, debit to cost of goods sold, credit to inventory. All right, flip over to page 100. Cash receipts journal. Remember the thing they have in common here is there's a debit to cash. So you'll notice you've got your date column, a description of the transaction. The first accounting column says cash DR at the top meaning that's the amount of the cash that would be debited to the cash account. It will go in that column. <coughs> right? So whatever the cash received is goes in the cash DR column. Then you've got a series of columns to accommodate the various credits or other debits that would be part of your journal entry. Now, you may find it easier, instead of trying to directly um, record or journalize the entries directly into the special journal, just write it out like you would have done if you were using the general journal. Write out the entry, what are my debits, what are my credits, and then look at the journal itself and try to put the debits and credits into the journal. Because keep in mind, even though we're using special journals, debits and credits still have to balance. Okay, you still got to meet that basic accounting rule. Using the special journals, debits and credits still have to balance. So within the sales journal, or the cash receipts journal, at the end of the month, you're going to want to check all your debit columns and add those totals together, and then you're going to want to add all your credits together and make sure that they're in balance, both for the cash receipts and the cash disbursements journal. Now, you'll see the various columns across the top. If your customer takes a sales discount, you're going to debit the sales discount account. You've got accounts receivable as a credit. So if you receive payment from your customer, you're going to credit their receivable, and then you're going to post that to the subsidiary ledger, and then at the end of the month, you're going to add up that column that says accounts receivable credit, and you're going to post that total credit to the accounts receivable <coughs> control account. Now, if your debits and credits don't already have a predefined column, this column over here that says sundry accounts, sundry just means other. So as you're writing out your journal entry, if the other debits and credits are not already in a defined column, just use those last two columns over there. You've got a column to enter debits, you've got a column to enter credits. And just before that, just to the left of that, you've got a column for account number. 
So if you need to debit or credit one of those other accounts, indicate the account that you're going to debit or credit in the account number column on the cash receipts chart. All right, cash disbursements works pretty much the same way, except now instead of debiting cash, we're going to credit cash. So that's your first accounting column is a credit to cash. Then you've got other columns for debits and credits, and you've got your sundry accounts over here to the far right. It works the same way as it did over here. You use the debit or credit columns, and you don't already have a column for it, and you indicate the account number where you're going to post that debit or credit. So that's the journalizing process. You're going to use those special journals to journalize your activity. Then, once you've completed the journalizing process step of the accounting cycle, you're then going to post those journals to the general ledger. And you'll notice the general ledger starts on page 103. Flip over to page 104, you've got a series of general ledger accounts. Remember, general ledger accounts are in financial statement order, meaning we start with assets, liabilities, equity, revenues, and expenses. So your assets are listed first, cash is listed first, and then you go through your current assets, and if there were journal entries that have already been recorded, you'll see some things that have already been posted. You don't need to duplicate that. Okay? Just add those new journal entries where you've journalized those entries from December 26th through December 31st. Once you've posted your entries to the general ledger, make sure you go through and update your account balances in your general ledger. At that point, going back to the instructions, on page 84, you will then be ready to do step number four. Okay. Now remember, we're going to analyze the transactions, we've journalized them and using the special journals and the subsidiary ledgers, and we've posted everything to the general ledger. And we've recomputed our general ledger account balances. Now we're ready to do a check of the general ledger, and we're going to create the unadjusted trial balance. Okay. We're going to create the unadjusted trial balance. To do that, you're going to take the balances from your general ledger account starting on page 104. The general ledger account balances run from page 104 through page 121. 104 to 121 are your general ledger accounts. Again, assets, liabilities, equity, revenues, and expenses. You're going to take those account balances and you're going to transfer them to the worksheet. Okay. Now your worksheet, you're going to have to skip over a couple of pages, starts on page 132. You've got a 10 column worksheet that starts on page 132. On your worksheet, it lists the accounts in financial statement order, just like in your general ledger. So it starts with cash, petty cash, accounts receivable, allowance accounts, etc., etc., etc. It starts on page 132 and continues on page 134. So you've got two pages in your worksheet where you're going to post your balances from your general ledger. Now you're going to use the first two columns on page 132 and 134 where it says trial balance at the top. Okay. You've got a column for debit balances and a column for credit balances. So all you're going to do is transfer the account balance from the general ledger to the worksheet. That's all you're going to do. It needs to match whatever is in your general ledger needs to be reflected on your worksheet. Be careful when you're transferring balances from the ledger to the worksheet. Make sure the debits are in the debit column. Other accounts will have credit balances. Make sure you get those in the credit column. Because what's going to happen if you take a debit balance and put it in the credit column? Well, trial balance is not in the balance. 
and you're going to be scratching your head and spending minutes or hours trying to figure out why it doesn't balance. Okay? Simple mistakes like that can make a world of difference. Okay? But that's part of the manual accounting process, is learning how those things carry or flow through the accounting system. Now, the goal, the objective of part one is to complete that unadjusted trial balance on pages 132 and 134. You need to show me a proper trial balance, proper format. You're going to need to add up all the debits and the debit columns, both on page 132 and 134, and show me a grand total of debits about halfway down where it says total. You're going to do the same thing for the credit columns. If you've done, if you've journalized everything correctly and you've posted correctly and you've transcribed your balances to your adjusted trial, unadjusted trial balance on the worksheet, your debit should equal your credit. Okay. That's the purpose of the trial balance, to make sure debits and credits are equal. Okay. If they're not, you're not done. You can't go any further in the accounting cycle until you find the errors. You've got to go back through your steps. You've got to look at your journal entries. Do your debits equal your credits? Did you write everything in there correctly? Did you add everything up correctly? Did you post it correctly? It can be a very tedious process if you've got a lot of mistakes. So you have to be very, very meticulous and very, very careful as you move through the accounting cycle. Okay? From journals, from ledger, to trial balance got resources. You've got discussion boards, you're going to have group members, and you're going to be able to email me and use the discussion board. If you get stuck or get lost, I need help. Okay. Your biggest challenge, your biggest obstacle with this is you've got only two weeks to finish it. Okay. The biggest learning curve is in the early stages. Once you start to learn how the accounting system works, it will start to move much quicker. So take my advice about looking at the earlier journal entries, transactions that have already been journalized for you, understand those, spend some time understanding how those are reflected in the journals. It will pay you dividends in the long run. Okay? If you jump to December 26th and start trying to journalize and use special journals and do it without really understanding what it is you're trying to do, you will spend more time in the long run, I guarantee you. I've done this before. Okay. Questions about part one. When I hand this back to you and you get ready to do part two, I'll, I'll come back to this and do a little bit more explanation. But really, that's all you need to get started and work on part one. Okay. Remember, part one is worth 100 points. You need a total of 140 points total on the project. No, I would ask you if you got that question, but you probably don't at this point, but you will. You will have questions. Okay. Use your resources, the discussion board, groups, and email me questions through the blackboard. Flash was on nobody else's phone. Okay. I will help you, I will give you guidance, but I won't necessarily tell you what you Alright, that's the practice set workshop.